approximate. We're given what Jesus said. We are told that these are his sayings, and he has said that himself in the word by declaring that these sayings of his were things that we are told to do. That if we did them, then our lives or our house, the very tabernacle we live in, the building that we are, as well as our external house that we build, would be likened unto a wise man that considered well the materials that he made the house out of. That he built his house upon a rock, and when the storms came, and when the activities of life, the circumstances assaulted that house, then it stood. But he said, those that don't do these sayings of mine would be likened unto a man that when he built his house upon sand, the storms came and washed it away, and there was great destruction. So Jesus was making a distinction here about his sayings, his doctrine, as it says in the word that the people were astonished at his doctrine because he didn't teach his scribes to the Pharisees who had said the law of Moses, or the Pharisees say, or the, the scribes say, or that the, the Torah says, or that there was some doctrine that could be deciphered and interpreted. Because you see, in modern days, we do the same thing. Sometimes people have taken the Sermon on the Mount, as we call it, and said, you know, we need to interpret it. We need to make it logical, because obviously it was too extreme, and we know we don't want Jesus to be so heavenly minded. He's no earthly good. Or do we? We don't want to have these as absolute goals, you know, to be something that is impossible to attain, that we would never be like that, and that, of course, you know, since we can't do it ourselves, then it can't be something for us to do, or can it? We know that in modern times we have taken these and made them as though they were not directly speaking to people what Jesus said to do. And so it's hard to look at these without having some kind of rose-colored glasses on unless you take what Jesus said is what he meant. And when he said it, at the end of it, when he was done, he clarified that he meant what he said and said what he meant. So in looking at it, today as we do in this devotional study of it applying that God is speaking to us to me to you to the circumstances of our life to the arranging of how God causes it to work in us then we see in verse 10 as most people commonly listed blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake for theirs is the kingdom of heaven The brecha that is made is created by a Jewish custom of blessing and causing and wanting and desiring that a place be set apart, designated as a place that God is inhabiting, that God is present, that God is blessing. Because you see, God doesn't just bless, you know, evil works. God doesn't just bless commonality. God blesses what he chooses to bless. And when he does, he pours out, as it were, his spirit upon that. And when he does, it becomes a holy place, or a place that holiness resides, or a place that God's presence has come. And so when he says blessed, he is making a brecha, he is making a distinction between the holy, the place that God is, which since God is standing there in the Son of God, the Son of Man, as Messiah has come and he's saying this, then he can make a blessing. He can bless. He can cause that to go forward to the people who are persecuted for righteousness sake. Because the people at that time were under great persecution and they wanted to do the right thing. They yearned and ached, some of them, for God's deliverance. Now, most of the people wanted Roman oppression to be gone. They wanted their cause to be made manifest to Jesus so that Jesus could wipe out the Romans, that he could destroy the enemies of Israel, so that they could make Israel the number one nation in the world as 
the most messianic promises were made to Israel that one day it would occur that the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords would come and declare that Israel would be the nation of nations, that it would go forth from there peace to the entire region as well as to the land for a thousand years when Messiah come and reign. So they expected that. And yet, there were those oppressed that had some dealings with the Romans, that had some dealings with the Gentiles, that had some dealings with the Samaritans, and they said, they're not such a bad people. And God knew the heart of some of those who had been oppressed. So people often want their own causes made the priority. But God says, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. Now, righteousness is an interesting thing because in order for something to be righteous, there has to be a standard. How do you know if you're righteous? How do I know if I'm righteous? Based upon God making that determination. If God says, look at my righteous servant, am I able to argue with God? No. I mean, I could try. God looked down upon the children of Israel and he said to Moses, I'm going to wipe them out because they are unrighteous. And Moses said, no, should the Lord God do such a thing? Imagine what the people will say that aren't. And God tested Moses' heart in revealing that. And Moses interceded and saved the children of Israel at that moment because he could have. God could have wiped them all out and started with Moses again as he said he would. So, when God determines something righteous, it's by his own choice, his own will. So the standard of righteousness isn't for us to make. It isn't according to what we think. It isn't according to what we interpret. It isn't according to what we say. It's according to what God chooses to call righteous. So righteousness, when God said it in his word, was making the right choice. Hmm. If God is the one who determines righteousness, and God has his own standard, and God is the one who's going to live in us, and God said he would be with us, and God said he's going to make the decisions, and the Son of God here is to explain it all to us, I think that the right choice would be to ask God what his righteousness is. Oh, we've been made righteous. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. But what is righteousness? If it's making a right choice, then though we've been imputed righteousness for our salvation, what would a right choice be made today for us to be blessed? In the way that Jesus says, blessed are the, those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. The way we see, perceive, and know God in us is by allowing him to work through us to accomplish his purpose by revealing to us his plan his direction his intention his choice for us when he reveals his choice for us and you go along with his choice that is righteousness right choice making that's what righteousness is when you make the right choice. When you make the wrong choice, that's rebellion against the right choice. It is choosing the opposite of what is right, choosing what is wrong. So in reality, when you choose against what God says, you're choosing to rebel against God because it's either obeying or disobeying. So righteousness is just simply obeying what God says. So if God says, Michael, I want you to get up today and walk down to the street corner then if I don't walk down to the street corner, I'm unrighteous in my choice. But if I am righteous in my choice, I obey what God says, and I just do it. Now, a lot of people like to take God out of the picture and say, but God wrote it in his word, so I don't have to ask God anymore. Sure. Then you've made the Bible your God, because then you're treating it as though it were only a intellectual assertion rather than a personal decision based upon communication with God. God communicates to you his way of choosing for you how to live your day today. So if you want to be blessed, great. Now, 
anything you do, you can create persecution. That's simple. Go tick someone off. <laughs> but since we've determined that righteousness is based upon God and obeying God and doing what He says, then if we're persecuted because we're doing what God says, then we're blessed. Because the reality is, is that religious appeal can cause you to run right out there and make someone mad. And guess what? You're persecuted, but not for righteousness sake. You can be a zealot, you know, and be very politically activated, you know, and actuated. And you can get on the bandwagon to yell at someone or to be very vocal about your opinions and be opinionated and be whatever it may be and cause great turmoil and angst amongst other people that they would be angry at you and you provoked them and that's not for righteousness sake irregardless of what cause you think you have righteousness is determined by the person holding the standard for righteousness and that is god so making the right choice is a matter of making a personal decision to obey what he says to you today or to disobey so when you are obeying and you run into something that is not <laughs> all that enjoyable like persecution then god says you're blessed because i am aware of what you are going through i will be with you in persecution i have caused you to know that i will reward you with myself in that because he says I declare to you that the kingdom of heaven which I have said has come upon you the kingdom of heaven which I said is all around you that yours will be the kingdom of heaven. Yours is the kingdom of heaven because you've been persecuted for making the choices that reveal that you are in the kingdom because you're doing my will. How do you know you're in the kingdom? Do his will. How do you know you're not in the kingdom? Ask him. <laughs> That's the kingdom of heaven. So wouldn't you ask the king of heaven whether or not you're in the kingdom of heaven? Because you see, where Jesus is, he brought the kingdom of heaven to earth he revealed that him inside us makes us in that dimensional interrelational aspect of a spiritual dimension existing and coexisting in a physical reality of the third dimension or fourth if you want to include time that we exist right now as we can corporately see feel and identify but in quantum physics we know that dimensionality goes beyond what we can see feel touch and hear and that there is extant within the reality of the creation that there's more to it than just simply four dimensions so when we are related in that way of the dimension of the spirit of god then we are in the kingdom of heaven because he's in us and we are opportune to be involved all about us in that kingdom that god is which is a spiritual dimension of course with god it goes beyond that praise the lord but when Jesus says, blessed are you when you're persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, he knew he was going to give to those a choice to make. Will they do these sayings of mine or will they not? Because he said, if you do these sayings of mine, the storms will come. But he said, if you don't do these sayings of mine, the storms will come. But he said that if you are doing the sayings of mine, if you are making a right choice, if you are being persecuted for righteousness' sake, then not only will your house stand, because it's founded upon a rock, not only will you be right choice-making or righteous, you will be doing, frankly, bluntly, exactly as Jesus said. What will you do? Are you going to philosophize, spiritualize, interpret, exaggerate, set aside? Or will you do what Jesus said? Blessed are the persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven.